Well, good morning. Welcome to College Park. I'm Pastor Matt. Let us uh, stand together as we enter this time of worship. We're just going to jump off with uh, singing the song about the Lord's greatness and all that he's done for us. So let us worship him. We're thankful for uh, your goodness and how you provide for us in these ways. And we just have a few scriptures that I'd like us to read together uh, on the screen here. You guys can be the top section and then I'll respond at the beginning. So let us with one voice read this. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Then he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. And by his wounds, you have been healed. 
And so, Lord, we are thankful, just as we sang, O hero of heaven, uh, you came from heaven to earth uh, to, to die for us sinners, and it's by your wounds that we are healed. And so we just give you thanks and praise um, in return for that today. And all those in agreement said, amen, amen. Well, you may take a seat. We're going to transition into a time of uh, uh, offering and, and prayer. And also, just like last week, we reintroduced the attendance books. And again, that's a, we want to do that because it's helpful information to know who's been here with us so that um, as our care team here at the church continues to grow, we have contact information to know who has been here with us to reach out to you. So thank you. Um, the ushers are going to come forward as we sing, and they're going to um, collect the offering, but then also hand out these attendance books. Just sign your name and pass it on down, and then we'll, we'll do the rest from there. So thank you. is waiting God so loved the world Amen. Amen. You can take a seat as we transition in this time of communion. This morning I remind us of what Jesus gave us for the supper. 
so that he may nourish us in this time, be refreshed in him. Too often we have a view of the Lord's Supper that is guilt-driven. A lot of times we think this time is primarily about what I need to do to fix things. I need to remember and confess every sin I've committed this week or since the last time I took communion. I need to feel guilty for how far short that I fall. We make the Lord's Supper about us and our sin instead of about Jesus and his grace. Now, don't get me wrong. The Bible says communion is an act of worship only for his children who are walking with him. So if you're not a follower of Christ, then I would urge you to let the elements pass. And if you're a believer, but you know that you're in a place of, of constant willful disobedience right now, then you need to deal with that. But most of us, the reality is we come here on a Sunday probably aware of how sinful and undeserving we are. And we bring our burdens and our pains in here. And we need, to, we need God to refresh us with his grace. We bring our doubts and fears into this time of worship. And we need God to grant us assurance. We come aware of our sins and how messy we are. And so we need the gospel of free grace applied to our lives and hearts again. And that's exactly why God gave us, why Jesus himself gave us this act of worship, what we call communion or the Lord's Supper. This isn't what we do once we've gotten things right on our end. Remember that Jesus called all the disciples to follow him. He didn't say, get your life right, then follow me. He said, follow me. And then he spent the next three years teaching them how to live, how to love, how to obey, how to follow, what it means to live in God's kingdom. We do this believing God makes us right through the body and blood of Jesus. Yes, this can be a time to confess our sins, but instead of trying to clean yourself up or staying in a place of guilt here in our seats today, come to Jesus in the Lord's Supper as an act of faith where you say that he is the answer and he alone is what I need. Amen. The Lord's Supper is not about our worthiness. It's not about our fitness, but about the worthiness of Jesus and how he makes us fit to sit at God's table. So as you drink this morning, do so with an awareness that Jesus is still today in this moment, the sufficient savior for all of our sins. And he offers us grace to help in any situation that we're up against. As we eat and drink these physical elements, may God give us a powerful taste of the forgiveness and fullness that Jesus has for us. This supper is an invitation not for those who have gotten things under control or for good people. It's the invitation to the sinful and to the weak, the Christian who knows he or she is in need of God's grace. Jesus invites us to come to him in the Lord's Supper. Come to him. All who are thirsty, come. All who are weak and wounded, come. All who are aware of their sin and their need for grace, come now. And as you chew up the bread, remember and find hope in the fact that Christ's body was crushed under the wrath of God so that you would not. Amen. As you drink the juice, remember and rejoice that Jesus' blood paid for our unrighteousness and purchased our redemption. So we're going to do communion a little different today. We're going to have you actually come forward to receive the elements. If you're in the center section, come here to me. If you're over here, you'll go over, over this way by the drums. If you're over here, come over this way by the, by the organ. And if you're in the balcony, we'll have a server up there for you as well. But let's all wait till we've been served. You'll come up and take a portion of the bread and the cup and return to your seats. And then we'll all partake together. Let's go now before the Lord together, singing of his marvelous and wonderful love. Let's have our servers come forward. gluten-free option, just raise your hand and we'll get that to you.
singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Again, just our voices. Singing, how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love. Hear the words from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Corinthian church. He says, For what I received from the Lord, I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And Paul concludes by saying, Whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And Lord, indeed, may it be so in the lives of all your faithful, all your children, as we participate in this act of worship today, as we continue with singing, with, with uh, turning to your word for instruction and guidance and correction, that by our lives, we proclaim your son's death until he comes again. Meaning that by how we live, we proclaim the grace and the goodness of our God expressed through the life and death and the victory of Jesus Christ. How we live, may we make known that good word, that good news to the world, proclaiming your death until you come again. And it's in his name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, at this time, we're going to transition into the sermon, and we'll go ahead and dismiss our kids for Kids Church.
And this morning, uh, Roger is here to preach for us this morning, so let's give him a, a warm College Park welcome as he comes up. Thanks, Roger. Good morning. morning. We're going to continue our series in hermeneutics. Let's get it right. Just seeing that there are there are passages, there are verses that sometimes we uh, we know and we will repeat, but sometimes we might be just a little bit off in our understanding and our interpretation. And um, and so that we're going to have another one today, Proverbs twenty two six. And at first, I was a little concerned about this because it's kind of around parenting, and not all of you are parents in this room, although all of you are children, and so of some parents, and so that helps. But I would just say, I, thinking about this, like if you are sitting in this room and you walk out into this world after this, you have to be concerned about our next generation. And so I think all of us could uh, pause and pay attention to what Solomon has to say here and what he is promising and what is not being promised, um, but maybe the admonition that we get from this proverb. I was looking for some parenting wisdom, and I found a few tidbits from, um, from Twitter, and I just thought this would be fun. Um, you know, the wisdom and of the, it's all, everything's true on Twitter, you know that. Um, but it was parents who were just like, here's some things I've learned from parenting, and this might be helpful for you. One parent said, silence is golden, unless you have kids. Then silence is just suspicious. You know you've grown a lot as a parent when you watch your kid lick something in public and think, eh, he's licked worse. He'll be all right. <laughs> I just taught my kids about taxes yesterday by eating 38% of their ice cream cone. <laughs> Waking your kids up from school the first day after a long summer break is almost as much fun as birthing them. Can I have an amen from you parents? <laughs> yeah, uh, the teachers aren't saying that, but you are, Yes. But don't worry, Robert Fulgham said, don't worry that your children never listen to you. You probably ought to be worrying more that they're always watching you. And with that sobering note, let's talk about parenting. It's really not about parenting, but it's really about this, this um, admonition from Solomon of that we, one, we would train up our children. And so it's not just about parents because we have a whole church community that cares about this, the next generation. So we'll talk about this. It's a great responsibility. Um, parenting, one of the greatest responsibilities one can have at the same time, one of the greatest privileges I've ever known. But to be sure, it's a roller coaster ride. As a parent of two children and now two grandchildren, the cutest ones in the world, I might add, I can honestly say that it's one of the greatest blessings of our life. Now, as someone who's been around the youth ministry world for a little bit, and an empty nester, and now a grandparent, of those two cute children, you'd think I'd have a lot of parenting advice. But as I get older and I move further and further away from my children being in my home and me influencing them on a day-to-day -day basis, I feel like I have less and less advice for parents. I used to have so much as a youth pastor because I knew so much as a youth pastor. But today, I know I knew nothing as a youth pastor. And all I would say to you is that I don't know that I have parenting advice other than there's some incredible instruction in Scripture that we should pay attention to. And so I could go through a list of things that I think is important, but I think it's important that we stay in Scripture. Now, you don't want my advice in parenting any more than you'd want Mark Twain's advice. I like what he said, and some of you have heard this before. When a child turns 12, he should be kept in a barrel and fed through the bunghole until he reaches 16, at which time you then plug up the hole. Now, for those of you who don't know Mark Twain, he's an American writer and a humorist. So I'm assuming this is to be a joke. But he did have three teenage girls, so I don't know if it was during that time or not. But, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of people that have a lot of derogatory comments about child rearing. Um, I, for one, felt like, uh, Cindy and I felt this, like we just like loved every single stage. And we are actually, instead of saying, oh, I hate this stage, it was almost like lamenting that we were leaving this stage because we were moving in to a new one. And we just had that privilege. I think part of it is because when I, before we had children, we had people say, oh, wait till the terrible twos. And I just decided that that moment, that I was not going to have that kind of posture as a parent. 
Sure, there was going to be some negative things here and there. But we absolutely loved every single one of those stages, even the teenage years. And yet, there were some bumpy roads. So it's not an easy road. It requires patience that you may not have yet. It requires a sacrifice, some that you may not even know about yet. And it requires heavy doses of humility and a huge learning curve. And once you have something figured out in parenting, guess what? There's another stage coming, and it starts all over again. Now, I've read a lot of parenting books as a youth pastor, as a parent, and there's been some really good ones. There's some, some really funny ones that's like, wow, this really did nothing. Um, but I would just say, I would say to you, and I would hopefully today as we look at this, say that I think the best parenting advice that I've ever come across is what I find in God's Word. So let's look at that. Proverbs 22, 6. So we're going to kind of basically have some very simple slides because it really is a simple message. The process of parenting, Solomon tells us first and foremost, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Training. We know what training is all about. It's a process. We train in a lot of different things. Mitch and Renee were just here with their two children, our grandchildren. They were here for about five weeks and it has been a blast. We had so many fun things we did and uh, just laughed all the time, just creating memories. Um, but I will just tell you, I have never in a five week period said the word poo-poos more than I did when my granddaughter, two and a half year old granddaughter was here. We celebrated poo-poos. You get, you get dinosaur gummies when you poo-poo. And, um, and now that is just the common vernacular of our home. No, it's not. So that would just be weird right now. So, um, but it's just amazing how, how you change and the things you say when there is a two-year-old in your home. Um, our, our vocabulary certainly shifted for five weeks. I would just say that. Um, but it's just, parenting is difficult and it's been fun to watch Mitch and Renee in their approach to parenting. And I will say this, they're very structured and they're really set on establishing rhythms of each of the child, each child. And I mean, very strict. I mean, to the point where like, I don't remember us doing that. Now, Cindy would probably argue with me like, we did it. You just weren't there. Um, <laughs> I don't know. That's probably true. Um, but I just, I see the intentionality. And one of the things they've done is that like the, the rhythms of like, they're up so many hours, they sleep for so much. They're up for so much. And like, wow. We were just like, would just be thankful that anytime they did fall asleep. So there was such an intentionality about this. There's an intentionality about bedtime and things like that. And the information, the tools and the accessories you have as a child to rear children. Baby monitors are off the charts. It's crazy. We didn't have anything like that. Car seats that are actually easy to put into a car. Strollers, they roll like Cadillacs. And every parent has a camera in their back pocket. And they have about a thousand pictures of their two-year-old child already. I went home after college to look through photo albums and saw there was about six pictures of me growing up. And it was just like, it's crazy the difference between one era and the next. So in some ways, raising children's changed, definitely. It's a different ball game today. But in another, one thing has remained, that every parent must train up their child, as the proverb says. So what does Solomon mean by training up? So I looked at the root word of training. It's not a new concept. We know what it means. We've all trained. We train for sports. We train for jobs. We train in our education. We train for many things. And with any training, there's a goal, the destination. The destination. And with that, and once that goal is understood, you begin to set out a path to get there. And every parent, so one of the things I want to make very clear, this is not a parenting seminar. I have no path to give you. But I do know that Solomon gives us a destination. And so we should pay attention to that destination. And it's up to you as a parent, grandparent, aunt, uncle, to create that path with God's help and with God's word. Years ago, I heard a pastor say, and I had this in some of my notes from many years ago and some parenting stuff, you may set out to make sure that your child has a good education, a good job, is successful in life, has a great career. These are not bad in and of themselves. But if that is the end goal, how does that differ from the rest of the world? How does that differ from the parent who does not know Jesus? Jesus even said, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? Clearly, there must be more to training our children than making a good living and being successful. 
Jesus tells us, Matthew 6, 33, says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Seek first. First, every child must be trained, and all parenting must focus on different areas of life. Now, to be sure, parenting is not just about spiritual training. We've trained them in physically, emotionally, socially, and so many other things. We teach them the alphabet. We sing songs to them. All of this is training a young mind, right? Some of you can probably still remember some of those songs you sang as a kid, and it just in put it etched in your mind certain things. It may have been the alphabet. By the way, Aaliyah was walking around the house singing the alphabet song, and it was so fun to watch her loop from M all the way back down to L and then back up to N, and it was just like, not quite there yet, but I like what you're doing. And it's just a lot of fun. So we do those things, right? We do it in the physical world. We teach them nutrition, how to eat, when to eat. Um, just the difference between both of those girls. One just smashes it in her face. The other one daintily puts it on her spoon in her fork and never gets anything here. And if she does, you wipe it off before the next bite comes. But teaching children how to do that to ultimately begin to do it on their own. At first, you hold the bottle. Then they begin to hold the bottle. Then all of a sudden, they're shoving food in their mouth. Now they're using utensils and it just, it's the nurturing. We teach them how to rest and care for their body. We teach them that we, we create a safe environment for them to grow up in, to be seen, to be understood, to be cared for, to be fought for. We teach them socially. We have them interact with others, their age, with other families. We engage with other people, family, friends, community, church community. These are all a part of the plan. But we start with basic building blocks in these areas and we continue to build on them throughout a lifetime. And ultimately they can they end up doing this on their own. But what sets us apart as Christ followers is that we are called to train them in the way of the Lord, spiritual training. I remember reading a book by Chuck Swindoll. Now that's a voice from the past and a blast from the past. I think they still play his sermons on the radio. I don't even know if the guy, is the guy retired? Is he never going to retire? I think he's got about a thousand books to himself. He's just been one of those pastors who was an incredible teacher. I'm sure there are many great Christian parenting books but I had this quote in, in one of my files, and he said this, and it was just a great reminder. We receive our children from the hand of God, not as a soft, pliable lump of clay, ready to be molded into what we think that they should become. Each child comes with a set of abilities, intellectual, intellectual capacity, and a way of perceiving and thinking, all of which were endowed by God. And it is our responsibility as parents to make sure they know the way of the Lord, to understand who he is and who they are in him. The sentiment is caught in, in the word of God, and particularly in this passage, it's one of my favorites. I, this was a passage that really formed my understanding of parenting. And it's Deuteronomy 6. Actually, the verses are 6 through 9. And these words I command to you today shall be on your heart. You've heard this before, but listen to these. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other words, it permeates every aspect of your life. I grew up going to church, but this was never a part of my growing up. Spiritual things were in a spiritual building. And when we got in the car and came home, that stopped. There was no more conversation about who God was, who Jesus was, or even me needing a relationship with him. I don't fault my parents for that. I love them, but they were just, they learned to be good churchgoers. And when I read this, I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to make sure that I'm always having this in front of my kids. It's one of the best advice, I know I've shared this behind this pulpit before, that I got from Cindy's mom and dad when we got our house, is they gave us a chunk of change and they said, we're asking that you use this in one way, and that's to buy your most important piece of furniture your dining room table, because it's the only room in which everyone sits and faces each other. 
And that has been the best advice. And to this day, when we go to her mom and dad's house, we sit around that table, share stories, talk, laugh, pray, read scripture. All of that happens every single time we go because we're facing each other. Because he understands that that is a privilege to have the family and there is opportunity to impart wisdom. And I think that's something that all of us can hear. There's so much to this passage. I love this. And there's so many things you can talk about as you talk along, as you drive with your kids, as you drive to soccer practice. There's so many things you could apply here. And you can do that work yourself. But something I want to make sure I point out. That just before this, when, when Moses is saying, these words that I command you, what are those words? Listen to this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all of your might. These are the things we're to talk about. We're to talk about a holy God. And here is Moses trying to say, among all other gods, among all other peoples, he is our God. He is Yahweh. He is the I am. He is our God. He is one. And, and this is an important statement for Israel that this is what you are to do. If this is going to continue on and God's story will continue, you must impart this into the next generation. And all I was just say to all of us is not only parents, but all of us have an opportunity and a responsibility to make sure that these things are imparted into the next generation. And folks, we have some work to do. We have generations that are walking away from the church. So parents, we're with you. We're concerned. We want to walk with you. We want to pray with you as you impart these to your children. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. Love God with all your soul, might, and strength. The way we do this is through intentionally teaching what this means and what this looks like and how this gets lived out in the world. And we do this increasingly by modeling this as parents. Of course, when we do this in our home, then we support it with community around us. We support it with the church body. We support it with children's ministry. We support it with youth ministries. We support it by coming together to worship together. I don't have a whole lot of parenting advice. Um, but the greatest advice I could ever get is the, is the challenge of training up a child the way they should go and how this gets modeled by you personally. I remember hearing this from one of the first pastors that mentored me. And he just really spent time talking to me about how important it was that I live out my abiding faith in front of my wife and my children that if they were going to catch anything, if they were going to understand who Jesus was, it wasn't going to be up to the Sunday school teacher or the youth pastor, but it was going to be what they saw in your life. So the one thing, I don't have a parenting path for you, but the one thing I would say to you parents, I would also say to you grandparents and aunts and uncles, who you are is far more important than what you say. We can't create this dichotomy do as I say, not as I do. It's important to realize that what you do, who you are, will have much greater influence on them than what you say in terms of them becoming who they should be. In short, your abiding relationship with Jesus is critical when it comes to your children. Understanding who Jesus is and what it looks like to follow him and to love him will be taught by you. Now, it doesn't mean the church is off the hook because we'll support you. We'll, teach, we'll talk about this as well. But this is important that you are modeling this. You are leaving this, this out in front of your children. And I, I'll just say this. I know when we started our men's ministry back, wait, man, I don't know how many years ago it was. It's a long time. Maybe 15 or 16 years ago. I just remember talking to our men about this. And as a youth pastor, I just said, Guys, we have got to start modeling this for our kids. If you're waiting for our youth ministry to do this for you, we only have your kids for an hour and a half a week. You've got them the rest of their lives. So it's on you to make sure that you live authentically for Jesus in front of your kids. 
And I just think this is a fun journey to be on. And let me just tell you, if right now you're squirming in your seat as a parent and saying, I don't know how to do that. That's uncomfortable to me. I never saw that happen for me. We can help you with that. We would love to help you with that. And there's some wonderful parents sitting right around you right now that, ha- that, is, that are doing that. And we would love to journey with you. All I'm just going to say, if you hear anything from me today, when, it, when Solomon tells us, train up a child, there is a lot, not on what we say and do, but of who we are. And so if your abiding relationship with Jesus is not where it needs to be, I encourage you to begin that journey yourself. So let's talk about train up in the way that they should go. But before we do that, I just want to highlight something really quickly here. That it's interesting to note, he says train up a child. He doesn't say children here. That's not a plural. But he's saying train up a child. Almost as if to say, like, train up a child because each child is on their own unique journey. And we must understand that. So what is the way? If you read Proverbs 22, the rest of the book of Proverbs, you'll understand that there are two ways that a young man can go. The way of wisdom and the way of foolishness. The way of wisdom and the way of foolishness. The way of wisdom. There is a way of the world and there's a way of God. God's way is the way of wisdom. The way of our God ultimately is the way of Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So that is the way in which we are to go, the way of wisdom. And the role of a parent in training a child is to find that way, is to equip them to find that way. Proverbs 4.11 says, I've taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in the right path. It doesn't say, I told you what wisdom was. I told you what path to take. But I taught you in the way of wisdom. Andy Stanley wrote a great book that was called The Greatest Question. And in it just said, the question was, is teach your children to say, to understand what's the wisest, what's the wise thing to do in this moment? According to what I understand in God's word, what's the wise thing to do? And it's really the essence of what this is all about, isn't it? We want to teach them wisdom. The goal of every parent is to help their child understand and embrace God's wisdom. Secondly is the way of the child. There's another interesting angle of interpreting the way. The way of wisdom and the way of the child. The way we can mean God's way can also mean the child's way. Train up a child according to their way. It says a child. It doesn't say children. The point that there is not a formula to raise children all in the same way. There's no cookie cutter formula to raise children. Each child is fearfully and wonderfully made, as we are told in Psalm 139. Each child is created uniquely as God's masterpiece, Ephesians 2.10. So as parents, we must wisely navigate the training of each of our children as they are uniquely designed and gifted. Some of you parents know that what you did with your first child just is not happening with your second child. I just had a conversation with my sister Um, a few weeks ago, and she was reminiscing and telling stories of our childhood. And I said, Connie, I wasn't there. That wasn't my childhood. You were seven years before me, and you were out of the house. My childhood looked completely different from yours. And secondly, you're a different person than I was. You were involved in different things. I I I was involved in athletics. And I had all kinds of different interests that she did not have. So my journey was uniquely different from hers. And there was no way my parents were going to be able to parent me the same way they parented their first child who was a daughter. And so each of us have our unique path. And it is a privilege and sometimes a challenge to figure out that path with those, those children. But each child is created uniquely as God's master. So as As we navigate this, um, we can do this together with the church. So we teach them the way of wisdom, and we teach them the way in which they should go, the way God has designed them. I'm just going to pause here real quick. I put this on my notes, but I didn't mention it in the first service, that one of the things that we did uh, several months ago, maybe last year, was we did the Shape series, if you remember that. The Shape series is just helping you understand your journey, your spiritual gifts, your heart, 
your pa- what you're passionate about, your abilities, your personality, and the experience that God has put in your life to shape you into who he is making you become. I would say to you today, my one parenting advice, that's a great tool for every parent to take their child through. Just to help them begin to see like, oh, God's really, this, these are some of the things I love to do. Could God have made me this way for this? Hey, maybe. Let's talk about that. And then you can affirm that. Your grandparents can affirm that. People can affirm that around them. So it's a wonderful, wonderful tool. And I would just tell you that if you need those tools, I know I have them and I know we can get them to you if that's something you want as a parent. So as we pause there, training up a child in the way they should go. Um, I think I didn't stay up with my slides. But here's... The next one. A couple ways we can misunderstand this. Um, there, and there's a couple ways this verse gets misused, misunderstood. And, uh, and I'm just going to say, um, the first one is the way. The way I think that they should go. The way I, th- I think that they should go. My dad was a contractor, a carpenter. I, my dad had a hard time introducing me to his friends in Chicago. Because I was a youth pastor. And that didn't it didn't work with him. And he didn't know how to introduce me to people. And so this is my son. He works with teens. He didn't say anything about the church, youth ministry. He didn't say anything like that because he didn't just, it wasn't in his vernacular. It wasn't in his world. And he wanted me to become a carpenter. And I didn't. Now, I wish I would have gotten more skills than I actually do. But that was one of the things. And I always felt like dad didn't quite approve because I didn't choose his way. And I'm just going to tell you, if you are a parent and you have a way for your child in which to go, you're going to be disappointed. Because this is not what this proverb is teaching. It is not on you to decide the way of your child. It is for you to help them discern wisdom and the path in which God has designed them to go. And that's a beautiful, fun journey to be on with your children. So it is not your way. But there's another perhaps another understanding that is probably a little more painful. And that is that Proverbs, not just this proverb, but the whole book of Proverbs you pull back. Proverbs is not a bunch of promises that if you do this, A plus B equals C, it will always produce this. But it's rather a book of principles, of wise sayings, of of knowledge that, that Solomon has gotten from living life in observation. So there's not a promise here. So much of the book book of Proverbs should be understood as principles for living rather than promises for life. In the first verses of Solomon's introduction to the book, he indicated that these were guidelines to obtain understanding. But true wisdom comes from the Lord. Therefore, some Proverbs are the wisdom of men, good advice, but not ironclad promises from God that will come true in every situation. Think of Proverbs as a slice of truth, not the whole truth for every situation. Secondly, it's interesting to note that the one who penned many of these sayings actually broke some of his own advice. Um, And so, you know, there's a, you know what, all that to say is that anytime there's a human factor involved, you cannot lean on that as a promise. As a youth leader for many years, I've had more than a couple conversations with parents in desperation, struggling with this promise of this verse as a child has gone astray or veered off the path. And I've heard them say, like, it says that they will not depart from it. I don't get it. And that's a really, it's a struggle. And I would just say most parents, most of us have dealt with this at some level or another. Now, I'm grateful for where my children are today in their walk with Jesus, but I'm going to tell you without going into detail, that there have been a few times in my own parenting journey when I would say to Cindy, and I reminded her of this yesterday, I would say in despair, I have no business being a youth pastor if I'm this bad of a dad. And my guess is some of you have probably been there too in the moment. And be careful and go a little easy on yourself. But I'll tell you, it is heartbreaking to watch your son or daughter abandon the way of life that was taught to them and modeled to them. There are not easy answers as to why this happened, and it seems that life can rarely comfort us during those times. 
And I want to say to any parent that has experienced this or is experienced this, I'm in no way minimizing this pain and frustration. But I am wanting to be honest to say this is not a promise that this is going to happen. But I still believe that the way of the Proverbs, the way of wisdom, is still the best way to pursue. And I still believe that the way that you train is continue to live out Jesus in front of your child. I still believe they still need to see your love and your grace and your long-suffering and your faithfulness towards them and to the Lord. It's not over. I want to tell you it's not over. And sometimes it takes a long time. But I do know this. I know this from experience of my own brother, extended family members, youth ministry journeys, that there is somebody who is pursuing your child as much or more than you are. And it's the one who created him. He's not stopped pursuing in his love and his grace. You don't know who God's going to put in their path. So I want to encourage us, any parent, if you know of any parent, you need to lament with them because it hurts. It's painful to watch. But there are, we can walk alongside of them and just continue. One of the things that we do have, the promise you can give is that he will be present with you through this journey. That is a promise. He will be present with us. So I want to encourage you to think about that. There's another part of this that I just want to say, that even when they're old, they will not depart from it. That one of the things that I had to come to grips with in youth ministry, and also being next to a Christian college, is that even in the best of Christian homes, some of my favorite families watching parents do this, it was amazing to me when I would watch your children step away from faith. And I was just like, what? No way. And I was talking to Jerry Davis, and I was reading a bunch of psychology, Christian psychologists that said, it is important that every one of us hit a crisis of faith in our journey. In other words, there's a point in which I've got to try to decide, is that, journey, that faith that mom and dad have, is that going to be mine too? And that crisis of faith can be a moment, a day, a week, a month, and it could be years. That crisis of faith is real. And what they need there is not lecture. And what they need there is not pushing and prodding. What they need there is grace and love and faithfulness. So we'll pray for you. And I was reminded that as, it, as great as desire that we have to see them, that he, again, is pursuing them. So don't give up. Don't give up hope. And with that, I think I want to close with some of these thoughts. I, I caught this on social media. A friend of mine put it up. I don't know the author. I copy and pasted it because I thought it was so brilliant because I needed to hear this. And I failed to put the author's name on this. Some of you may even know where it came from. But I don't mean, how many of you have found yourself saying this? Whether you're a parent, grandparent, aunt, uncle, just somebody observing our world. I'm so glad I grew up in the era that I grew up and I'm not raising kids today. How many have said that? Okay. Bob, you and I have said that in our small group, I think. Yep, yep. As if it somehow dismisses us from the narrative, right? But listen to this. It was a post to all parents. Don't feel sorry or fear for your kids or your grandkids because the world that they are going to grow up in is not what it used to be. God created them and called them for the exact moment in time that they're in. Their life wasn't a coincidence or an accident. Raise them to know the power they walk in as children of God. Train them up with the authority of his word. Teach them to walk in faith, knowing that God is in control. Empower them to know that they can change the world. Don't teach them to be fearful and disheartened by the state of the world, but hopeful that they can do something about it. Every person in all of history has been placed in the time that they were because of God's sovereign plan. He knew Daniel could handle the lion's den. He knew David could handle Goliath. He knew Esther could handle Haman. He knew Peter could handle persecution. He knows that your child can handle whatever challenge they may face in their life. 
He created them specifically for it. Convicted yet? I was. Don't be scared for your children, but be honored that God chose you to parent this generation that is facing the biggest challenges of a lifetime. Rise up to the challenge. R raise Daniels, Davids, Esthers, and Peters. God isn't scratching his head wondering what he's going to do with the mess of this world. He has an army he's raising up to drive back the darkness and make him known all over this earth. Don't let your fear steal the greatness God placed in them. I know it's hard to imagine them as anything besides your sweet little babies. And we just want to protect them from anything that could ever be hard on them. But they were born for such a time as this. When I read that, I just thought I needed to hear that. And I, you know what it, it prompted in me? It's like, I all of a sudden started praying for my two grandchildren in a completely different way. I started praying for Mitch and Renee and Kara in a completely different way. I'm not lamenting the world that they're living in or what I'm living in. I am praying that they will rise up to the challenge that God has called them to. So to close... Here's just a couple thoughts. Key words, key strategies for parenting. Solomon tells us to train, to diligently teach your children biblical truth by understanding the person, the works, and the teaching of Jesus. And the best way that you can do this is model this in your own life. Yes, there's good books. Yes, there's Sunday school. Yes, there's youth ministry. Yes, there's help. There's community. But when you walk in and close that door behind you, now it is your journey with their children. Let them see Jesus. Help them make this journey their own. Understand that they may come to a crisis of faith. Continue to walk with them. Don't harp on them, but let them find their own story and their own faith. Teach them the way of wisdom. And then surround them with a community of like-minded people that will support your efforts. Hey, I have an idea. This is a community of people who are like-minded and care about your kids, and we would love to walk with you. I'm going to tell you, I have been here for over 25 years in this church, 16 years on staff. I'm still here today because this is the community that surrounded my family. I got to pour into people in this community, and they poured into me and to my children. And one of the greatest privileges is when we came back here and Mitch was sitting here and we were worshiping, he remembered. And he was thankful for what he had. Surround them with a the church community. There's just going to be times where you just need that community to step in because you don't have it this moment. You need that community around you. And finally, I would just tell you, pray on the armor of God on your children. Ephesians 6, look at it and pray it over your kids. I'm sending this, there's a prayer that Jerry Davis, my good friend, you know he's preached to us, he's, just, he's taken the, the Ephesians 6, wrote it out into a prayer for himself, but I'm going to send it to you and I would tell you, take it from first person, pray it over your kids, use their names in there, pray on the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet, the, the shield of faith, the sword, pray those things into your kids' lives and see what happens. Model it before them, teach them, and pray it into them. And we will join you in the journey. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity just to think about parenting. But more than that, Father, I have been challenged to think about my own posture, my own view of how I view this world and how I view this next generation. Father, I'm not lamenting and I'm not fearing. I am excited to think about who in this generation is going to rise up to live for you in a bold new way, to show us the way. We need this generation, Father, to live and bring light to this darkness. Father, may we model for them, may we teach them, and may we walk with them. And I pray, Father, that they would know the way, that they would know Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. And let us go ahead and stand together as we close. This is a prayer uh, just asking for the Holy Spirit to guide us as we go out and lead our lives as Christians and also for those of us with families and, and kids and 
just that the Holy Spirit would guide us and help us in, to not uh, part from the path that God has us on. Go ahead and take a, a seat for a minute. Coming up in the life of the church before we depart today. Uh, for one, we're looking forward to our baptism celebration next Sunday out at Craig and Vendetta Gutshaw's property. We'll have the address available next week. Uh, many of you know where they where they live. That's going to be at four o'clock. We have a, a few people going to take this step of obedience and faith in their life. And so we encourage everyone 
to come out, bring a chair, bring a blanket, something to sit on. We'll have plenty of food for everyone to, to share in after the celebration, time to just have some conversation and engage in uh, yard game activities, go swimming if you want. Uh, so we're looking forward to that time. If you are interested in being baptized or exploring it, right here actually in a few minutes, we're going to have a, a, a little gathering, a class together to just talk about it. Uh, going to the class doesn't commit you to it, but we will have some food uh, for lunch for those who might be interested today to, uh, to get together and talk about that. So you can just come see me or just come on up to room 200. Uh, many of you, all of us are aware of the... Uh, the situation in Kentucky with all the flooding, a number of people lost their lives there. And you're asking questions about our friends at the mission in Laurel, Kentucky, Nathan Boggs and his family. We go there a couple times a year to participate in their, their ministry efforts there. Uh, Nathan and family and the, their immediate area, they're fine. They don't, they're not having any flooding there. The mission hasn't been impacted. It's mostly areas about 20 miles north of them. But Laurel Mission is contributing to relief efforts in the area, and a lot of their supplies are going towards that. So some of you are asking, how can we help? How can we contribute? Well, you can see on the screen, there's two, two ways we're going to raise up. One, you can send monetary donations directly to them. You see the address on the screen. Take a picture of that or call the office this week. We can get that to you. Or um, another thing we're going to do is gather gift cards. Those of you who might want to contribute, maybe gift cards from Home Depot or Walmart or Target, uh, different places um, and, and gather those gift cards together and send them in a big package down to Laurel this week. So if you want to help out in that way, uh, pre please try to bring those into the office by maybe midday on Thursday. And we'll, Jamie will get all those together and we'll send them down. We do have a printout available at the Welcome Center. It has more detail on it if you want to pick that up, take a look at that. So um, yeah, so let's support their efforts down there. And lastly, we just want to remind our ladies today at 2 o'clock is our destination unknown. Bring $10. I don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing, but you're going to have a good time, right? Okay, let's stand together as Pastor Matt leads us in our closing benediction. And I do want to share one more just brief announcement. Many of you, She's more of a um, first service attender, but um, many of you got the prayer chain yesterday about our dear sister Carolyn Stevens passing away. So we just want to be sure to be praying for, for Donna and the rest of the family as they make arrangements for Carolyn's funeral. Um, and just if you know them well, reach out to them and, and give them some love uh, from their church family. So just wanted to remind you all of that this morning as you go. So let's bow our heads together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all as you go. And all those in agreement said, amen. Amen. Have a blessed week.